Well, hello. Welcome to the 10 Minute Talk Show. It is a talk show that is 10 minutes in length. I'm your host, Eric Forge. Welcome back to uh, to the 10 Den. Uh, <laughs> we are st my basement. Yeah, that's where we're at. We're still under quarantine, folks, and uh, I don't think that's a terrible thing for us necessarily. Um, I think the general public is getting more accustomed to late night talk shows that look like uh, ransom videos. So I'd say that uh, that works to our strength aesthetically. Um, yeah. So in the spirit of sticking with things that are optimistic and uplifting, uh, we thought we would focus on something that really doesn't paint more of a sunny picture of humans' future than Star Trek. Star Trek is very optimistic, but it makes us look very good in the future, and people are uncertain about the future, so let's just focus on that, right? Uh, we have the 10 standout moments from all of Trek history. Not just for me, not not just my hot takes. I got a great, I got some great line, guests lined up for you. I got past and present cast members. I've got uh, some people who have first-hand experience in uh, working with some Trek legends, and I even got some Trek experts lined up for you. Having said that, let's get right to the list. Coming in at number 10, uh, um, I first saw this actress on screen when she played uh, Bruce McCulloch's badass girlfriend on Kids in the Hall, and she went on to play Lieutenant Esri Dax on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Please welcome Nicole DeBoer. Hi, Derek. Thanks for having me on the show. Okay, my standout Trek moment would be from season seven of Deep Space Nine when Esri has gone to look for a missing wharf, and she steals a roundabout, and they end up... Um, they end up together in the Badlands and they are trapped there and they're alone and they end up having this big fight which turns into a passionate kiss but it's a it's a cute moment and um, it's definitely a, a standout Trek moment okay thanks so much for having me and thank you, Nicole. Okay, so for number nine, I picked the death of Tasha Yar. Now, it's this, it's this sort of absurd uh, tar monster comes out of the ground and just takes her out real quickly. Very galvanizing episode. Some people are like, this is so frivolous. How could you so haphazardly write off and just kill a cast member like that? And then there's the other camp, the camp that I'm in, which is like, hey man, if you can kill off a cast member so abruptly on an away mission and nobody's safe, it raises the stakes for the rest of the series from where I'm standing. Anyway, it's a galvanizing uh, choice. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about it, and that's why it's coming in hot at number nine. To number eight, we go to Kat Letwin, our first Trek expert. Kat, you have the calm. Hello there. My name is Kat Letwin. I am a Toronto based actor, writer, comedian, and of course, massive Star Trek fan, uh, and more importantly, a massive DS9 fan. Now, some of you may be thinking, um, <coughs> Kat, if you were actually a huge DS9 fan, wouldn't you be wearing a DS9 uniform and not a TNG uniform? And to that, I say, yeah, but here we are. Anywho, I spoke to Mon Frere, and we both agreed In the Pale Moonlight is one of the strongest and most interesting episodes. And for me, it's for two reasons. One, it deals with Cisco's moral malleability. Quick summary for In the Pale Moonlight, uh, in case you don't remember it. Uh, it's during the Dominion War. Things are going mm, bad for a Federation. So like every week, there are these new casualties that are posted. And there's always someone that you know who is now a casualty of this war. Is it worth it, right? Like... The lives of hundreds of thousands of people, isn't that worth the death of a criminal, an ambassador, and one Starfleet officer's sense of self-respect? And isn't that the question that Cisco ends up not only asking himself, but us during the captain's log? And at the very end of the episode, when he's looking straight at us and he says, asserting to us and to himself, I can live with this. I can live with this. But then he deletes the recording. I just, I think it's very cool and, and very, very fascinating. Anywho, um, those are my thoughts. Those, those, are my, those are my hot take on DS9. Um, I'm going to go play some baseball. <laughs> no, I'm not. We're in a quarantine. Anyway, see ya. Thank you, Kat. That brings us to number seven. For me, it is Star Trek First Contact. Not only my favorite Trek movie in the whole series, but also one of my favorite movies of all time. It has got Patrick Stewart going full Shakespearean. It's got the Borg uh, being terrifying. It's just, And it also shows, most importantly, it also shows uh, humanity at a pivoting point, going to, going to our full potential, casting off the shackles of inequality, and really, during these times, what we could use injected into our life is uh, not bleach so much, but rather some optimism 
for the future. That's what we need. Go and watch First Contact. Revisit it or watch it for the very first time. Okay, number six is also a movie, but it's not the entire movie per se. It's pretty good, but I'm more focused on the moment of the opening sequence. The first ten minutes of Star Trek Into Darkness 2013, the Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto era, the opening sequence of this movie is so strong, it's beautifully shot, the action is incredible, and it's got all the Gene Roddenberry core beliefs in it. It is such a beautiful opening to a movie. Just go watch that, if nothing else. It is a moment, and that's why it's number six. But not everything on this list can be cinematic brilliance, with his take on what he considers to be a standout moment, simply because it might be the worst moment in all of Trek history, is comedian Hisham Kalani. This is my submission for the worst episode of Star Trek ever created. It is from season two of Voyager. It's called Threshold, okay? Resident bad boy pilot Tom Paris figures out a way to create a transwarp engine. He creates the engine, puts in a shuttle, blasts off into space. They lose contact with him. They find him adrift. They bring him back. They're like, this weird radiation is affecting you somehow. And he starts, like, shifting. Like, he loses his tongue. He can't speak. He starts growing extra eyes. And he panics, breaks free of sickbay kidnaps Janeway, gets back into the shuttle, and just flies out into space, and Voyager freaks out. They track him down to a planet. The ship has landed, and they can't find Janeway and Tom Paris. But what they do find is two orange and black six-foot salamanders who have mated and literally made like a litter of baby orange and black salamanders, and they scan them, and they find out the two salamanders are Janeway and Tom Paris, somehow the radiation turned them into six-foot lizard monsters, and the crew just beams them back up into sickbay. The doctor miraculously finds out a way just to hyperspate them with some syrup to turn them back into humans, and Janeway's like, we're never speaking of this again, and they just fly away. They abandoned their lizard children. Do you know how horrifying that is? The repercussions of that? Brandon Braga, one of the producers, longtime producers on Star Trek, considers it an absolute stinker, and he said it on the DVD commentary, okay? That is my submission as the worst episode of Star Trek ever created. Number four, never aired anywhere. It's just a personal story from a guy who met a Star Trek legend. He's been on YTV, he's been on Inner Space, and he's always on Twitch. Welcome back to the show, AJ Fry. Uh, so my story uh, is actually about uh, LeVar Burton, who is one of my favorite Star Trek stars. I've had the pleasure of interviewing him a number of times and hosting panels with him over the years. And in 2018 at HalCon in November, I broke one of the rules of being up on stage. And it was, uh, I suppose, um, making it about me and less about the audience. And I thought because we had this history, maybe that would be okay. But LeVar Burton uh, definitely put me in my place. So essentially, uh, while up on stage, after asking him some perfunctory, you know, questions about him, himself, I said to him, you know, uh, LeVar, you've had this great career, obviously. You're inspiring to so many people. Um, you're so focused on education with Reading Rainbow. Uh, I hope it's okay to ask you this, but I just myself am finding myself out of work uh, for the first time in 12 years. My show was canceled back in May. I don't know what to do next. And I was wondering if you uh, ever in your long career had a moment of uncertainty um, and how did you deal with that? And he looked at me in the eyes and he looked out at the audience and back to me and said, no. <laughs> a huge, huge laugh from the audience. And I, I thought, okay, yeah, no, that's totally, you know, if it's honest, uh, puts me in my place. And also a huge laugh from the crowd. And then, and then that's good. Uh, it was wonderful. And LeVar Burton is honestly one of the best people to talk to and interview, uh, not just from Star Trek, but just from anyone who I've ever had the pleasure of sharing the stage with. Thanks, AJ. For number three, we also have a personal story, and this one's coming from me. It was the series finale of Star Trek The Next Generation. It was uh, Timmins, Ontario, 1994. I was at an OSSSA conference, and we just happened to be lucky enough that the audiovisual guy uh, happened to be a Star Trek fan, and he taped it that night and brought it in and so we could watch on the big screen in the auditorium. It was a bunch of, uh, just a bunch of teenagers watching a show together and really having a moment. And when we got shown the primordial ooze from which all of life sprung, it just made me realize how precarious life is and how lucky we are to be living on this planet. It rocked me to my core and stuck with me till this day. For number two, we have a current cast member. She plays Kayla Detmer on Star Trek Discovery. Please welcome actress Emily Coots. Hello, Derek, and all of the 10-minute talk show viewers. Upon reflection, I think I'm going to go with Such Sweet Sorrow, 
season two, ep 13. Um, it was the first part of a two-part finale. And for me, it was just really touching. Uh, something about the writing and deciding to jump to the future together as a crew um, was really inspiring to me. And I was going through some personal stuff and it just aligned with this idea that sometimes you have to jump and the net will appear, hopefully. Um, and there was so much uh, fear and unknown that went along with that decision for each individual, but um, it showed the strength of the crew and the and the unity of the crew um, that they would follow Burnham into this, you know, completely uncharted territory. Um, very touching for me personally. So, live long and prosper. And for number one, we simply cannot ignore the standout moment of the first scripted interracial kiss on TV. It was November 22nd, 1968. It was Shatner. It was Nichelle. It was scandalous. It was a story. It was a victory. It was beautiful. And it was silly. Are you kidding me? It was an interracial kiss. The fact that it was such a story back then and is a non-story now really bodes well for humanity, and it speaks to the exact thing that Gene Roddenberry was talking about, a promising future where we, as humans, are better. And in many ways, we are. Yes, we got a long way to go, but we've made some progress, even from 1969. So, hope you enjoyed the list. Thank you so much for our guests for chiming in, and thank you to Gene Roddenberry for all the optimism. Take care out there, folks.